Welcome everyone. Today we're at uh, the UVA Radio Podcast uh, Studio and uh, we have the honor of talking to Professor Adam Tooze. Uh, Adam is a professor of history at Columbia University and most recently he's written about uh, the financial crisis in his book, uh, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises uh, Changed the World. And, and even more recently he's written quite extensively about the economic impacts of, of coronavirus. Uh, so, uh, welcome, Adam. How are you? Uh, good. Glad to be here. Um, well, we're happy to have you here. Definitely. <laughs> uh, first question that I want to ask is, before we kind of go into the, into the, the depths of this crisis, uh, we've been following you quite uh, intensely on Twitter, and, uh, and what I'm curious is that you really write history as it occurs. You really, uh, you know, take consideration into... All the all the recent details, and you create a narrative as things occurs. I, I'm wondering, is it is it difficult to do this? What are some of the challenges you face? Well, I mean, uh, intelligent political commentary and economic commentary does. It's a matter of routine. I don't think of it as being any more demanding than the job of that kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I have the practice of a historian who writes narrative history. I've written previously about the early 20th century, which is more conventional history, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, I have the habit of archival research and a particular you know, habit of, of reading texts and modes of criticism that come out of that tradition. But I don't really think of it. I, 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 to me, it's a little bit of a puzzle why this is even, why this is even a serious I don't mean this as a criticism of you, but I, I'm more puzzled than people ask, like, so how difficult is this to do? Well, it's, it's just as difficult as any other kind of economic and political analysis is. Okay. Um, the, the risk, and it's a huge risk, is that you're just simply wrong. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you're not giving yourself the advantage of massive degrees of hindsight. You're, you're taking a position, you're proposing an interpretive line um, mm. in real time or close to real time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing it without the vantage point, you know, the, the much, the much ballyhooed vantage point of, of distance and so on. Um, and obviously, that that involves certain risks, and mm -hmm. you can easily just you can easily just misunderstand what the moment's going to be. I mean, in January, this this not not just January, in early March, I was still working on a big manuscript on the political economy of climate change mm -hmm. um, because that seemed to me to be, and I still does seem to me very to be urgent and facing us over the long run. And that's a wager, right? That's not just uh, that's not just an intellectual investment. It's an investment of time and of effort. And um, all of a sudden, it's obsolete. Essentially, it's mm -hmm. anachronistic. It's not what we need in this current moment. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found myself being caught up with by the book that you kindly referred to, the book about two thousand and eight, which which seems more pertinent to, more relevant to the the current moment, to many readers. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's being kind of used as a script, it seems, by a generation of journalists whose work I had it the, turned into the narrative of crash. Yeah, the material, yeah, yeah. The material of crash is journalistic commentary, uh, working papers. Many of those people, many of those journalists and economists are still now my Twitter buddies, <laughs> so, where I've gone from being somebody who read their stuff, which they published five or ten years ago, to being somebody who's in immediate dialogue with them, shoulder to shoulder, if you like, and trying to make sense, even in part conducting interviews with pe people who are involved in policy making at this moment. So really, at that point, doing work, which is very difficult to distinguish from that of a journalist. Um, but that's true of contemporary history in general. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, obviously, this comes against the background of being somebody who doesn't think of history history is being detached from the present i think of, yeah, yeah of absolutely history is being, this is a, is a kind of a, a, a cliche is, is all history is essentially contemporary history and at some point i realized the real problem with that was not so much that there was this leakage from the present into the past but the form that that leakage took and the, the real problem is that you're you're better informed about what was happening a hundred years ago than you are about what's happening in the present. Yeah. So the problem is that your ignorant bit, your prejudice, your uninformed bit is influencing the bit that you're actually seriously informed about. Mm -hmm. um, so with Crash, I started a process of trying to reverse that with all of the risks that that entails. In other words, really trying to commit myself to being as informed as I could be about the immediate past. Yeah. I, I, and that is, it, it subjects you to the risk of obsolescence, immediate obsolescence, it subjects you to the risk of being wrong. You literally can feel day by day how your assessment of a situation is being reshaped by events. Mm 
So my, my polemical position now, challenged by colleagues, is that every historian should re write at least one project or one book <laughs> in this mode. Because you, you, until you've done it, you write about history, but you haven't really experienced the force of history. Mm -hmm. you, you, you retrospectively reconstruct it, and you can imaginatively sort of place yourself in the position of actors. And of course, we live as actors in history, mm -hmm. but you haven't actually subjected yourself to the whirlwind of trying to incorporate intellectually reality as as it happens you just read the newspapers as an amateur and then yeah. you go off to be a professional about history right yeah and uh um that's 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 the for me both the cost and the benefit i'll admit now that it's become completely addictive and <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, well i'm on you know this channel talking to you folks right now and mm -hmm. that wouldn't be the case if i was working on on, on World War One at this particular yeah. moment, and I'm not saying that you know I long to be on podcasts. It's just that <laughs> once you something are, that happened, yeah. Once you are, it's something that happens, and it's a network that you're inv involved in, and those are the people that you're thinking with, and those are the people I have regular. On Twitter, you'll know it's really a day-to-day -day exchange between extraordinarily smart journalists, extraordinarily smart think tankers, and some academics who are pinging things back and forth. With yeah. It's my daily seminar. It's a day-long seminar every day mm -hmm. of what we should be reading yeah. and and what smart takes are out there right now. Yeah. So it's very it's very intense. Yeah, and and as you've mentioned, uh, I mean, previously you've really written extensively about uh, the 20th century. Uh, and of course, one of the main themes uh, that always comes up is is war. And I was wondering whether, uh, when 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 analyzing war, the, whether it's the First World War, Second World War, if is there a commonality between uh, the dynamics of war and the kind of situation we have right now, where where some people have already called it a war economy? Yeah, I, I'm I'm precisely because I have spent a lot of time studying the history of actual war and. I'm a very suspicious of that kind of metaphor. I mean, mm -hmm. it's obvious why it's employed politically, especially in countries like Britain and America, where we have nostalgic, positive associations with war. It's much less common in Germany, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. a political culture that I'm deeply attached to. Um, so, so I'm quite skeptical of that. Like, this isn't, to my mind, a war economy situation in any meaningful sense, other than perhaps the scale of the financial needs. But in other respects, it's the re precise reverse, right? We're in a, and that's what this, it's historical novelty. We're not mobilizing, we're demobilizing. We've never done that before. We've never tried to macroeconomically demobilize. We've mobilized, demobilized individual sectors before. Mm -hmm. And decarbonization, for instance, in the green transition would be a job of demobilizing the fossil fuel sector. But that would then be a sectoral industrial policy problem, not a macroeconomic problem. We've never done a, a comprehensive macro demobilization. Um, why I, I mean, in part, I'm a, you know, I'm a recovering military history kid, basically, <laughs> early 70s Britain with a military history thing, you know, a bit of a problem. <laughs> and um, I spent, spent a lot of my adult life, life trying to get, to get over that. that. Um, but, but I, I think, think intellectually what I've taken from that is obviously it's central to the violent periods of European history and European history from, well, uh, the medieval period, certainly from the early modern period forward through to 1945 is the history of organized warfare and conflict. And after 45, it remains that in a way which we find difficult to acknowledge, um, be it in the Cold War, be it in post-colonial struggles. So insisting on the presence of, of organized violence in the military has always been one of my, one of my projects intellectually. Mm -hmm. But I also think it does introduce a mode of thinking and a mode of politics which is different from that of either economics which is to do with development and the development of the social and economic system or politics which at least ideally ought to be about deliberation and decision war has an antagonistic an inherently antagonistic quality to it it's a it's a force field it's a zone of human activity governed by the logic of conflict and struggle it's the difference in economics between maximizing a problem and actually treating it as a strategic yeah. interaction and a game theoretic problem and that's a radically different intellectual domain to be operating in one of the reasons why it's not helpful to think about this as a war is the virus isn't intelligent <laughs> it's adapt, but it isn't actually a cognating strategic actor um, so once we've figured out how it adapts, it becomes essentially a problem of optimization in relative in relation to that uh, that strategy because the, or to that behavior because the virus doesn't actually doesn't need to behave or strategize. Yeah. It just has a certain biological logic which we need to understand. Um, 
So for me, thinking about war has been highly, been very important um, in terms of realizing that even in modern history, which we so often think of as either being dominated by the normative principles of modern politics, human rights, and so on, or economic development, there remains this element of antagonistic conflict, which is irreducible in certain fields, and historically has been crucial. Um, and so that's, and, and in a sense, it echoes through societies which are still self-consciously engaged in that mode of interacting, have that then as a sort of reservoir, repertoire of thinking. Mm -hmm. And you see that extraordinarily vividly in moments like this. And sometimes it's apt, and sometimes it's terribly misleading. And in 08, 09, it was a very stark difference between especially the American decision makers and, the Europe, and their European counterparts. It's how readily the American decision makers went to an essentially Clausewitzian military mode of thinking about the world. And um, Professor, now that you mentioned the, the 2008 crisis, uh, Something that's very interesting, as as you've been discussing, is that the the enemy or the the sort of like adversity we're facing this time does not come from the financial system as it came for for example in 2008. So, which of the two you think posed the biggest threat in terms of um, the scars that it could leave in a rebound, sort of like in the aftermath of a crisis? Which of the two you think might be more problematic if you were to compare this crisis to the one in 2008? Well, I mean, I think at this, the current crisis is very complex, right? Because it, the, the original threat, obviously, is in the public health system. Mm. It's, it's not even the disease per se, but the impact of the disease on our public health system. Mm -hmm. and, and then, as it were, in a second order effect, what President Macron highlighted yesterday in that remarkable interview with the FT is that we made this collective decision, itself unique in history, to respond to that pandemic threat by shutting the global economy down. I mean, that's totally unlike any previous moment in public health history. No one has ever done this on this scale before. It's not, you know, they've been quarantined, but not, I mean, yeah. even the Wuhan quarantine was the largest quarantine in history. Now we've gone like, yes. this. <laughs> breaking records. A huge talk. You know, we, uh, you know, in an Orientalist way, we say, well, the Chinese do this all the time. Nonsense. The Chinese <laughs> have a quarantine like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a huge decision for Beijing to make. And then everyone has all, and to me, the most sort of staggering one is the Indian decision to shut in. I mean, this yeah. is like, this is extraordinary. Um, historically, but no less significant in some ways, South Africa, you know, many of the sub-Saharan African countries are adopting very rigorous lockdown policies, which, you, which are it's deeply surprising. That then generates a huge knock-on effect in terms of real economic losses. Mm -hmm. and, the financial crisis element, which it was not entirely absent, but really came to the fore in March and may yet still wrap round and strike us many months from now, was as it were the anticipated effect on the economy anticipated by the financial markets, because that's their business, uh, in March was then producing what looked like the symptoms of an impact of a financial implosion, even before the virus hit and even before the economic effects of the lockdown had made themselves evident. So that is the war the central banks were fighting in March. Uh, or to put it more aptly, I think, they were desperately trying to, as I said in the Guardian piece earlier this week, flatten the curve of yeah. financial panic. That's really what they were trying to do. Spread the pain out so the pain comes later and the financial system could absorb it. Mm -hmm. That means that this crisis has got many more layers than mm -hmm. the 0809 event, which was a classic, in a sense, business cycle. You have an overexpanded sector, real estate fed by its own indigenous, if you like, credit system, Real estate is historically linked to the financial system. Many of the biggest booms and busts have been driven by that combination. This one was epic in its scale. It was transatlantic. It was novel quantity of flipped into quality. This was a different scale of problem we'd ever faced before. But fundamentally, it was that kind of a crisis. And then the tail wags the whole dog, because once the real estate sector and the banking system go down, then all of a sudden GM can't get refinanced, GE's in trouble. <laughs> Professor, you mentioned you mentioned sorry for the interruption, but you mentioned the central banks as as a key sort of actor in this in this sort of like time of crisis management. Do you think it's dangerous to allocate this role of a fighter of a firefighter uh, in times of crisis to central banks? Is there any danger on relying on them to such degree when it comes to tackling this crisis? Well, I mean, uh, clearly there are. I mean, the problem is, of course, also what are the alternatives? Right? Yeah. So, I mean, there are disadvantages, undoubtedly. The problem is, you know, well, what is our alternative? And insofar as this crisis is a crisis which is reverberating within the financial system, and as such, it's a crisis of confidence, there really is only one actor. And we've known this ever since the 1850s when Badgett wrote his classic text about Lombard Street and the function <laughs> of the central bank. 
Um, we have a uh, financial system which is profoundly unstable, inherently unstable, and it needs a competent manager, and that is what the central bank does. So we can't function without central banks. Mm-hmm. It becomes dangerous when you rely on the central banks to do a whole bunch of things, which is not, as it were, their specific job. Mm-hmm. But the question, of course, is, are you doing that out of choice? Or are you doing that because really all the other alternatives seem worse? And that, that's the situation we've been in for quite a long time now. And it's paradigmatically the case in the Eurozone, where we're effectively relying on the ECB to hold the system together because the political choices that would be required are too much, it seems, and you know, I'll just accept this to be going along with, in the judgments of German and Dutch politicians, they yeah. just don't think they can get that deal done. Now, I profoundly disagree with them and hold them accountable for that, but mm-hmm. that is the situation. And from the point of view of Eurozone stability, we can't afford to wait around while they make up their minds, nor can we risk really holding their fingers to the candle and just seeing how much they squeal when the full consequences of their irresponsibility become evident, because that pan- poses too many costs, and those costs fall on the people who are, you know, at a disadvantage economically and financially. It's not the Dutch and the Germans that will hurt most if the eurozone spasms. So then the ECB intervenes, and then the cycle just sustains itself because mm-hmm. neither the decision makers in the Hague or Berlin ever really get to live the full consequences of their own position, and and that I think is a really toxic situation to find yourself in. Mm-hmm. Well, I I do want to get into the the dynamics of the the European uh, that cri- I don't know if we can call it a crisis yet, but in a sec I do want to get into it. But what, what's also very interesting is right now central banks have essentially uh, taken up. Uh, the legacy of the, of the uh, whether it's in the Fed or the ECB, what they've done uh, as a response to the 2008 crisis, crisis. Uh, and yet at, at the moment they seem like there, there's very little wiggle room. We have historically low interest rates. Uh, do you think monetary policy by itself has the has the capacity to solve this crisis? No, of course not. And no, no mm-hmm. one in any of the central banks thinks they do either. I mean, and, and that was true in 2019. That was true last year. And they knew it then, too. And they were saying as much. And I mean, Draghi, that was Draghi's final message to the Eurozone. Mm-hmm. Folks, if you don't do fiscal policy, we are stuck. And on the other hand, if you don't do fiscal policy, I have no option but to act. And I'll do that even if German conservatives go crazy when I do, because I have to act. I'm a responsible decision maker here. Mm-hmm. And he's a deeply devout and committed European. And he was desperate at the at the failure of the European fiscal policy decision makers to act. So no, no one thinks that the central banks can fix. In this case, it's blatantly obvious because the solution has to lie on the public health sector. So because it's a stacked three-tier problem, if you like, the central banks know that all they can do, all they can really do is stabilize financial markets in a way which means we don't have a financial heart attack piled on top of everything else. Mm -hmm. They may at the margin be able, therefore, to help with the real economic recovery, but no one is right now kidding themselves that lowering interest rates is going to persuade any business to invest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you can't invest if you can't go shopping, right? So... So that's, you know, we literally don't know what any of us, how any of us are going to be living four months from now. Like under those kind of conditions, investment is going to die and you could offer negative interest rates, if you like, and you're still not going to be able to persuade people to invest. So no, the central banks are just holding the ring. And the other crucial thing they're doing Mm -hmm. is creating room for massive fiscal policy, which Mm -hmm. could help. Jumping in the topic of of fiscal policy, Professor, sorry for the interruption, but... um, Many, many economists now have, have started um, proposing a lot of solutions for the long run. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting ones is for, from Professor Kirkman, and he proposes not only uh, elevating the levels of debt, like we're seeing currently, but also being accustomed to having high levels of debt. So he explicitly proposes uh, the U.S. to handle a 200% uh, debt of the GDP sort of scenario. How much political appetite is for that? Because as you mentioned, from the from the monetary side, we're quite constrained to a certain degree. How much, how realistic are those kind of proposals? Yeah, I mean, it's basically an admission that, you know, our destiny is Japan, something like that. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that doesn't turn out to be the worst thing in the world. I mean, let's face it, the Japanese growth rates aren't exciting, but then their population is shrinking. So in terms of GDP per capita, you know, we should probably abandon this idea that Japan has been suffering through terrible decades, lost decades. Right? Since that's our future, we should probably get used to it. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't by any means have to, be, have to be a disaster. You can park the stuff on the central bank balance right. sheet. There are technical issues that arise from that, no doubt. But 
It doesn't have to be a huge drama. Um, the question, I agree, is political, and it's all about the politics. And the politics is not now. I mean, right now, especially in the United States, because A, there's a Republican in the presidency, which is all the difference. <laughs> if Joe Biden gets elected in November, expect the GOP to be a fiscally responsible, hawkish, debt-reducing austerity party the day after he's elected, literally. Mm -hmm. Fox News will change its agenda. They will have deficits and debt written on the television channel every single day, and they will hammer, 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 exactly the way they did with Obama. And as the moment Trump was elected, Fox started stopped talking about debts and deficits. So it's completely partisan, and the GOP is to that extent, I don't know, it's a remarkable instance of a political party apparently almost entirely devoid of principle when it comes to fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. it, it, and I don't really even say that as a criticism. It's just astonishing how, mm -hmm. how, they, how they pivot. So provided we have Trump in the White House, I wouldn't expect anyone in the United States anyway to cause any fuss about debt forever, like, um, because the Democrats aren't going to, or at least not a majority of them. Some remain sort of centrist deficit hawks, but they don't have the loudest voices. And the Republicans won't, so long as they have a Republican president to win, which is, after all, not something that we could exclude as a possibility then it will get very sticky. And I expect the same thing in Europe as well. I mean, the Dutch, in a sense, have made things easy for us because they are arguing this line all the way along. But mm -hmm. you know, in a normal political system, <laughs> you would expect people at this moment to be going, let's spend now because it's the decent thing to do. We care about our fellow citizens. Evidently, this is not the moment to be talking about bills. That really would be disgraceful, wouldn't it? But we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. which is which is um, when austerity politics started after 2008. It wasn't in 08, 09. The Germans did a stimulus in 09 at the beginning of 09, modest, and they didn't put it on, you know, in bright letters, but they did a stimulus. It was an election year in Germany too. Mm -hmm. The austerity talk starts in 2010. Paul mm -hmm. Krugman, who you cited, had, had a great line, and he simply said it all went wrong in 2010. Right. So it's 18 months down the line after the crisis that the that the real battle starts politically. Mm -hmm. And it is the more powerful people with the better organizations and the better lawyers and the higher levels of endurance who will wage that war because it's a long war. Because what we're talking about is the distribution of costs and benefits. Very large asset classes are at stake. People with a lot of wealth have a lot riding on the issue of how that is worked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's great that you already uh, touched on the, the dynamics of the sovereign debt crisis in 2010 because yeah, back then it seemed to be principally uh, framed in between Greece and Germany, and now we're seeing this conflict between Italy and the Netherlands. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of questions to pose here, but do you see the scenario repeating itself, the 2010 scenario of the sovereign debt crisis repeating itself? I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, of course, that the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone exploded around Greece in the spring of 2010. Mm -hmm. But I think in the background, it was always really about Italy um, because because Greece was a problem, but Greece was not too big to bail. Um, and you could even imagine letting it fail. So all of the options were on the table. Basically, you could bail it out or you could do a Grexit or you could do, you know, Schäuble's idea of a timeout. All the options were there. It enabled also a radicalization of politics around Greece because all of the options were there. Mm -hmm. um, Really, the Eurozone crisis was always about Italy, insofar as it was a sovereign debt crisis. Insofar as it was a financial crisis, it wasn't really about sovereign debt at all. It was about banks. It was about Ireland. It was about Spain. Um, but insofar as it was a sovereign debt crisis, the fundamental issue in the Eurozone was always Italy. Um, and so the high point of the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone is really 2011, mm -hmm. uh, not 2010, um, when the credibility of the Berlusconi administration in, in Italy is put in question. And that's really when the screws were applied and, you know, as it were, the, 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 the tension really reaches its maximum. That is then brought under control by the end of 2011. And then as the mm -hmm. summer of 2012 heats up again with contagion between Spain and Italy, you then finally get the intervention, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it takes. So the, the continuity is, in fact, direct. Um, Italy all along has been the strategic issue. Why? Because it's so big, because it's too big to bail. You can't. There isn't a plausible scenario in which you run a Greek style program for, for Italy, apart from anything else, because the Greek program involved resources from the IMF and the IMF is never going to provide a backstop mm -hmm. for an Italian program. Yeah. And, and, and Italy is a, is a trillion, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a grown up type of financial problem. It's fourth largest, I think, uh, sovereign debtor in the world, or maybe even the third, United States, Japan, and then I think mm -hmm. Italy or Germany and then Italy. Um, so it's a, it's a really major uh, debt, debt problem. 
and and the failure of the eurozone over the last 10 years to come to terms with that either in political terms or in macroeconomic terms in other words setting the standard macroeconomic setting of the eurozone such that nominal GDP growth, the combination of inflation and real GDP growth in Italy is large enough to make their debt burden sustainable is, is basically the, is the disaster, it's the strategic disaster of the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. That's what the benchmark of Eurozone macroeconomic policy ought to be, not whether the Germans and the Dutch are happy with the inflation rate, but whether the nominal GDP growth in Italy is rapid enough to bear down from that, 135 yeah. to 30 percent of GDP down to 120, when we can stop worrying about it. But as long as it remains at 135 percent of GDP, if you have any big shift in the spreads, any major increase in Italian interest rates, it tips very rapidly into unsustainable uh, mm -hmm. arithmetic, and the markets know that. Yeah. So there's a constant panic, and 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 the, the the strategy tactically for the ECB is to hold you in the good equilibrium where everyone's calm, and so it is sustainable because spreads are low. The only strategic way, and I'm talking in military terms here again, the strategic <laughs> way of fundamentally changing to accelerate. That's not easy to do, but mm -hmm. the fact that that hasn't been the priority of policy, right. I think, is really telling. Yeah, and and yet, I mean, maybe this is a, just a, a small good truth to salvage out of this, but we can see at least Germany's response. Uh, to the, to this well, corona crisis has been more cooperative on some levels compared to its uh, compared to the 2010 crisis. Do you see I, that I, as a? I think they're doing a good job of mm -hmm. dressing up their position, <laughs> and the Dutch are making it incredibly easy for them. Right. Um, that would be my view. Mm -hmm. I mean, cooperative. Uh, not in the first instance with Italy. Uh, not in the first instance by way of the ECB. Not on the fundamentals of Corona bonds. Yes, they're doing a big stimulus, but if you look into the details of it, not that much of it is direct spending. It doesn't compare to the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of direct spending. In fact, several other Eurozone members in terms of GDP, shares of GDP, it looks enormous in terms of guarantees issued by way of their policy bank, the KFW, which is a great tool to have. And that may, in fact, be for a country like Germany, which isn't suffering the worst of the crisis. Um, and has a strong and viable business sector loans may be the best way of doing this. Um, but it's not as though Germany stepped up and said, you know what we need to do, we need to do a really, you know, a grown up mm -hmm. fiscal policy for the EU, what we really think is a couple of trillion dollars for the EU budget, and we, we're back in Corona bonds wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Just and a marginal gesture. Yeah. Yeah, the astonishing thing is that Weidmann did. I uh -huh. mean, yeah. you know, Weidmann, who consistently really has been a critic of ECB activism, voted for Corona bonds on the council of the ECB. Mm -hmm. Big coalitions of highly influential German economists came out and said, this is the moment, this is the right thing to do. The Spiegel did the same thing. Yeah. So it's also, it's you know, there are, of course, there are reactionary conservatives in Germany who will hold the line all the way down. But the odd thing is that Merkel and Schultz, who are the key players in this, you know, the heads of the CDU and the SPD respectively, mm -hmm. and Schultz at the finance ministry, have, have are dragging behind uh, what in fact is a kind of fairly solid coalition and opinion polls show the same thing opinion polls not dumb ones which just ask people you know what do you think about x but ones which actually dig into people's opinions and provide them with some information suggests that the german electric is winnable for corona bonds at this moment so mm -hmm. politician with you know if merkel and schultz got on ahead of this and said in the name of the grand coalition we think we should do this of course you'd lose 15 percent to the afd mm -hmm. but but, you know, there are bigger fish to fry at this moment. Yeah. So you mentioned um, just recently uh, with your explanation on, on German um, sort of like policies, how a lot of expenditure is at least being masked or at least being funneled to sort of tackle the crisis. Yet, um, as you mentioned before, also, this crisis is different. This crisis is about uh, stopping down the economy, basically put it in this sort of like frozen state and then basically taking it out and try to minimize the damage once yep. uh, we put it back on. Which are the specific policies you think are necessary to make sure that we minimize all these scars and all this damage that we're doing it by stopping the economy? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's fair that you can use a fairly simple contrast between the US and Europe here, and it's a helpful, it's not, you know, it's not precise in every detail, but it's, it's a useful kind of heuristic. Mm -hmm. In that 
the American labor market is often celebrated for its flexibility. And working here at any level, you discover that. Uh, it has advantages and it has disadvantages. It's flexible in the sense that it's easy come, easy go. Unemployment rates that are measured tend to be lower. Um, but on the other hand, in a crisis like this, it produces d disastrous results, right? So we've just had a hemorrhage of uh, jobs in yeah. the last yeah. month. Um, uh, you would have seen the number yesterday. We think 22 million people have signed on for unemployment insurance um, uh -huh. in the last four weeks. The, the number that I just can't get out of my head is that 25% of the workforce of the state of Michigan have signed on for unemployment. Yeah, 25% in a single right. month. I mean, it's just in, mm. inconceivable, right? That's, that's Great Depression levels of unemployment in four weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is in a society which at the beginning of the year, not just the beginning of the year, in February, was celebrating record low unemployment. So we've gone from record low by post-war standards to, you know, well above the post-war record in a month. Um, and this is in a society in which um, um, health benefits are tied to employment. So millions of people now face the terrifying prospect of being without health care in the middle of a public health crisis. <laughs> Yeah, this is um, great. It's great. absolutely devastating. And in a society where the unemployment insurance system exists, you've seen in the EU, in which the, the terms of the compromise are such that all states must have an unemployment system, unemployment insurance system, but they don't commit to actually paying insurance to people who are unemployed. Hmm. So states like Florida and Georgia specifically design their system to exclude 85% plus of people who are un actually unemployed. So Florida and Georgia have take up rates of between 11 and 14%. So you have a mass unemployment crisis in a society in which large chunks, I mean, nation state sized chunks, don't have basic welfare system safety nets. That's going to cause scarring and damage. It's going to cause scarring in people's personal finances. It's going to destroy wealth. People are going to take years to recover if they are ever able to. And we know this crisis is also selectively hitting the African-American population. Far better to have a European-style system in a situation like this, mm -hmm. where you have something like comprehensive healthcare, so the medical bills are taken out of the equation, and you have short-time working systems, which mean that you can continue employment relations across the crisis and you use the public budget to fix that. And the Americans are trying to string that together using these loans, which are forgivable if you keep your staff on, but they've come too late and they're coming too slowly and they haven't persuaded roughly, you know, 22 million people, well, they haven't saved 22 million people from being laid off. So that's the crucial thing. And then beyond that, it's all credit. This is why the credit system is so crucial because what you need to basically be able to do is for firms, small firms in particular, which don't have the reserves to be able to borrow to see them across this crisis. And that's why preserving intact the credit system, which was the battle of March, is, is so crucial because the whole, the government, which will be providing benefits, but also the private sector, which will need to, as it were, just smooth the its its budget, you know, and just try and pretend that Q2 2020 never happened. Hmm. That depends on being able to get credit. Do you think on the topic of credit, do you think that we're setting a realistic burden to financial markets or is more specifically perhaps traditional banks when we hear policies such as um, the delayment of interest payments, do you think that um, they are in a good position to withstand this sort of damage, being the shield of society in a way? Yeah, I mean, uh, some better than others. And, and one of the mercies, I think, of this, of this crisis is that the banks have so far been a second and third order story. It's quite possible, I think, for exactly the reasons that you're mentioning, that they are basically going to suffer major hits to the quality of their portfolios. Basically, loans become non-performing. Um, that they will become a bigger story further down the line. And in Europe, where the banks are fragile anyway, um, this is a particular concern. And where are they most fragile? They're most fragile in Italy. So it's, again, mm -hmm. it's a terrible, cruel twist of fate that the crisis should have hit Italy first. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what I think more generally is, is that the, the Basel 4, 5, the latest stages, stages of bank regulation, regulation have worked quite well in the sense that they basically removed the banks from the story. Um, people talk about this crisis, unlike 08, not being a bank crisis, but being a financial markets crisis. It's a crisis of asset management and fund management. And the banks will say, oh, if only we weren't laboring under the regulations of Basel and Dodd-Frank, we would have been able to make markets. You mm -hmm. would have had the liquidity um, uh, bottlenecks that you saw in the second and third week of March. 
I would say thank God for that. I, uh, you know, for some, JP Morgan may be a well-managed bank with a fortress balance sheet that could have handled those risks, but we know there was always going to be bad apples. And then yeah. what you've got on your hands is a banking crisis too. The, the effect of that is that most of the risk ends up being absorbed onto the balance sheet of the central bank because then you see where you don't have the imme- intermediating um, buffer of yeah. the balance sheet of a big bank. But I just don't think that's a risk after 08 anyone wants to be taking. Yeah. So mm-hmm. better to have a system which is market-based most of the time for finance. And then when things fail, you have the central bank stepping in as the fund manager of last resort, the buyer of last resort, the market maker of last resort, rather than having the banks as intermediaries. So I agree in the longer run, the banks may become a problem so far so good but, and I would be particularly worried, I think, about the European, the European ones who, you know, for this, for them is a is an absolute nightmare, as it is for the business sector in general in Europe, which of course had a terrible. It's not as though European big business did well out of the handling of the eurozone no. crisis. It was smothering for mm-hmm. for business and investment across the continent. Yeah. So, John, you mentioned very briefly the the Basel agreements and all, most of the implications, uh, especially for Basel three. Uh, were these sort of um, extra buffers for systemically important banks. So there was clearly a recognition in terms of the vulnerabilities that lied within the interconnectedness of banks. Now, this crisis is different in the sense that at the beginning, as you mentioned, it was a shock perhaps to supply chains. Are we expecting in in the same manner that we saw uh, an attention being played for financial intermediaries, do we expect some sort of protectionist policies coming from the supply side to sort of like diminish this risk or is this just not the case for this crisis i'm not i'm not sure that i would expect the same sort of regulatory intervention because the regulatory intervention for the banks after all has to do with a their their exorbitant privilege <laughs> like the fact that they basically are the magic money tree yes. um <laughs> And, and and B, that when they fail, they, they have uh, systemic implications. And that's not true for a car manufacturer. Um, in a big American or European economy, a single company like that does not have systemic implications in the way that a bank failure does. So there isn't the same immediate regulatory imperative, if you like. For countries where, you know, large private entities are more significant, for the entire macro economy, there would be a more obvious reason for doing that kind of intervention. But, but where I think we are clearly going to see interventions um, is going to be in the you know basic supply of personal protective equipment. We've mm-hmm. all seen the stories, ventilators and so on. And it has to be said, you know, that, that the imposition, I think the, the Peterson Institute report the last week, I think, I mean, something like 65 countries have imposed export bans on yeah. medical goods now if we cannot have a credible convention to prevent that from happening the next time around then obviously everyone with the option to have local manufacture of something as basic as per- i mean we can make them at home it turns out so like <laughs> you know, this isn't this isn't this isn't going to be a story that that transforms the history of globalization but yeah. you would expect regulations to be put in place either to have absolutely massive stockpiles or you know, we have some textile manufacturers that have the capacity to flip on ventilators. Again, you know, they're not they're not the highest tech piece of equipment. I think the main bottleneck now is actually can you train enough of your medical staff to operate them? Mm-hmm. Because because they you know they're not quite what we imagine. You plug yourself in and you're all good. Right? They're actually <laughs> incredibly toxic. They're horrible to be on, yeah. and and you need super expert people to operate them. Yeah. Otherwise, they just kill to kill the people that are on them. I mean, more often than not, they die anyway. So. So, but nevertheless, building that kind of reserve capacity and that kind of regional, it doesn't necessarily mean deglobalization in the sense even of corporate ownership. I mean, I'd mm-hmm. perfectly happy to have a Chinese textile manufacturer having a plant on the east coast of the US. The ownership isn't the issue. Um, it's, as it were, manufacturing capacity. So we might end up with a model which is more like the auto industry, mm-hmm. the car industry, where you have global ownership and regionalized production networks mm-hmm. um, as one of the things that comes out of this. On the whole, how this plays out for globalization, I think it's, it's too early to tell. But, um, you know, if trade is our main metric, you could see an absolutely perfect storm of factors. And the WTO has highlighted this coming down the pipe for for trade. I mean, we're going to see the largest, I think, collapse in global trade right, ever right. Um, over the next 12 months. Yeah, well, yeah. I, and from there, I, I kind of want to jump to uh, the situation right now in emerging markets, because it seems that uh, in the US and Europe, 
at least some level of precautions are being taken and, and uh, there, there's yeah, good things that be, are being salvaged. Uh, and yet, uh, and also in a recent article, you've, you've called this the biggest emerging market crisis ever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it does yeah, seem. It's a good headline. It's certainly a very big. <laughs> it is very effective. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, it, obviously, it does seem to me that these countries are not only going to reel from the the financial and economic effects, but uh, they're also going to have serious difficulty coping with the health effects. Uh, so so, what's your opinion on this? Well, how is it going to go for these countries? I mean, the, the, the serious point behind a headline like that is that we have never, ever seen a simultaneous shock to all of the emerging markets and the advanced economies on which they rely for export markets, mm -hmm. like the one that we're seeing right now. And it's completely unprecedented. And many of them have adopted, you know, uh, advanced economy lockdowns. So uh, their own local efforts are, in fact, very dramatic and very substantial indeed. And it's testament really to the sophistication of what we continue to call emerging markets. I mean, believe it or not, South Korea still counts as an emerging market. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, we're yeah. going to have to reevaluate that particular <laughs> position. Um, um, so, you know, the Corona mortality metric will, will, will shuffle, reshuffle the pack somewhat. Um, mm. Mm. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, this is, this, is, this is absolutely unprecedented in its scale. And you're right, the, the shock wave, of course, hit them first. Well, it hit them first from China, because many of them are very directly connected to China. And, and China is, of course, for your emerging markets. Uh, they export raw materials and subcomponents to China. Mm -hmm. And so really, from already from the Wuhan lockdown in 20, 23rd of January, the, the ripple effect was working its way through the emerging markets. That's when you see their currencies begin to slide. And then mm -hmm. in March, they go off a cliff. And we've seen absolutely spectacular devaluations of several key emerging market currencies, South African Rand, uh, Turkish Lira, mm -hmm. uh, the Brazilian currency Real went collapsed across the board and a huge withdrawal of funding. Mm -hmm. So now they've basically been hit by the loss of China as a, a source of demand, the collapse uh, and, and pressure financially, the dollar soaring. So all of their dollar denominated debt becomes more expensive. Yeah. Now, as you say, the public health crisis is going to hit. And we glibly say they're young countries, they don't have many, you know, stop, stop, this is a stupid thought. Mm -hmm. um, India has the second largest number of people over the age of 60 in the world, unsurprisingly, because it's the second largest country in the world. Mm -hmm. So 120 million vulnerable old people in India, 7 million people living with HIV AIDS in South Africa, huge vulnerable populations, fragile health systems. And then on top of that, in the final round, as it were, the implosion of advanced economy demand the American consumer is the beating heart of the global economy still. No longer the absolutely dominant monster it was in the 90s, but the American consumer is still the largest single chunk of global demand. And we have seen a collapse in American consumption like we have never seen before. You can mm -hmm. take the graph all the way back to World War II, it's basically and then off a bit uh, this spring. So that's a huge shock that's going to shoot out through value chains around the world. And the question, of course, is also how do we put this all back together again? Because yeah. we used to, as it were, and this is an important qualification, right? Since 2013, at least, the emerging markets one by one have been suffering a series of very severe crises. It's not as though this came out of a blue sky. No, the absolutely. emerging markets have been in trouble since 13 with the taper tantrum, then there was the oil shock, then there was mm -hmm. Argentina, then there was China round one. You know, this is a rolling crisis from their point of view. And all of a sudden, the support from the advanced economy demand side and from China falls away as well. And, and it's not obvious they have a growth model for a scenario like mm -hmm. that. It's not obvious that we really understand how this world economy that we're so proud of um, fits together. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a deep question. And, and people were looking for more guidance, to be honest, from this spring meeting session that we've just had in, in you know, the virtual session that we just had in DC. And it wasn't a total disaster, let's face it. The Trump administration you know, chose the WHO as its target this yeah. week, not <laughs> another important international agency. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, you know, we can't be confident right now that the, the structures of international governance, I mean, mm -hmm. think of the WTO and like the multitude of disputes that will arise from a situation like this. Yeah. And we know it's, it's basically dead in the water as a result yeah. of the obstructionism of the Trump administration. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, what can the U.S. do, though, regarding this? What what can the U.S. do? Because as you also mentioned in in, in crashed, uh, the, as soon as 
you know, the, the, the worst of the 2008 crisis was handled. Uh, the Fed started issuing dollar swap lines and a lot of emerging markets benefited from them. Right now, a lot of those countries have much bigger economies and we're, we're talking 10 years into the future and they're probably going to need way more credit. So uh, yeah, how, how, how should the U.S. Uh, deal with the, these issues? Well, the Fed has been very proactive. I mean, mm -hmm. it did the 2008 playbook on swap lines. You know, there's a, there's a kind of little nerd herd of swap lines enthusiasts around the world, pages of Alphaville, who have sets of council foreign relations, a whole community of us that monitor this. And mm -hmm. it was astonishing. I mean, they did the swap line schema of 2007 8 in two weeks. They did the first group for the advanced economies, which are standing relationships now between the ECB and the Fed. They don't need to change anything, they just improve the terms and the way the swaps went. And then they expanded to the full group that they were providing in 2008 14, which includes uh, Brazil, South Korea, Mexico as emerging market clients in that mm -hmm. relationship. And then the big question was, what are they going to do next? As you say, the, the world economy has become much more multipolar. Do they really have the means to expand? And what they decided to do was not more swap lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of the big emerging markets like Indonesia, for instance, are connected to regional swap line networks with the Bank of Japan. So if Indonesia really needed dollars through a swap, it could get them from the Bank of Japan, which could draw them from the US. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, doesn't, you don't need a Fed line directly to Indonesia. Um, and the other, what, but what the Fed did do, which I think particularly, and we know, I bring up Indonesia, A, because it's huge and often underrated, and it's a G20 member, and it has a highly sophisticated central bank. And because mm -hmm. we know they asked for a swap line from the Fed and were turned down. What they got instead was a repo facility, which is a, is a collateralized borrowing facility. So mm. it's basically how the ECB does all, almost all its business this way. You give them a good piece of collateral and they give you 95% of its value in terms of cash or even a higher percentage than that. And the Fed opened a facility like that for all of the central banks in the world which have standing with the Fed, which is, which is a big innovation. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fed has found ways to pump dollars out. The yeah. real problem are not so much the sophisticated emerging markets, um, from this point of view, they have problems in the private sector. They have very, very large entanglements with global capital markets. It's lower down the food chain that the real the problems start. And and you don't have to go very far. Turkey, for instance, I mm -hmm. think a lot of people are extremely worried about. South Africa, uh, people are very worried about. Why? Because they don't have large piles of U.S. treasuries in a big national foreign exchange reserve, which they could repo. And because of the politicization of the Turkish Central Bank, mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve is never going to give them a spotlight. Yes. And because Erdogan is Erdogan, he's announced <laughs> he's not going to do business with the IMF because Erdogan's entire career comes out of the post-2001 Turkish financial trauma. And so for him, it would be a disaster to have to do a deal with the mm -hmm. IMF. So where does Turkey go? No swap line, no foreign exchange reserves of, of a substantial kind, and no willingness to do a deal with the IMF. That makes people nervous. So if Absolutely. you look at the Turkish lira, it's just gone basically on downwards, on downwards, despite the efforts of the Americans to pump dollars into the global system. So what they may have been able to do at the very least is turn this from a completely comprehensive dollar financial world crisis into a case by case uh, problem. That would be that would be something. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you mentioned, of course, the, the politicization of all these um, um, swap lines in your book crash. And now you, you, you reaffirm that there's a lot of politics behind, of course. Do you think that after this crisis, we're going to go more towards that notion of a G0 world? So a, a world without like a clear hegemon um, imposing... Well, we're already, I, think, I think, I mean, I like that, that Ian Bremer's phrase, famous phrase. I mean, I quite like it. I, but <laughs> but what, I don't, what I don't like about it is that it implies there's no order. Whereas what I see is like a world with multiple overlapping logics right. um some which are highly cooperative and frankly the swap line system and the dollar based system works tolerably well um it's difficult to imagine another system that would work better i mean would we want the you know would, would you want the ecb to be in charge of the global i mean i, 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 would, prefer the, I would prefer the rank pragmatists at the fed who just do whatever it takes to keep the you know the wheels of business greased yeah. um mm -hmm. so so that's a bit that works quite well. You know, um, if you think about networks of, say, tech trade and communication, they were working quite well too until the geopolitical uh, 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 blow up between China and the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think of the world not so much as, as it were, 
G G zero so much as a sort of multipolar mm -hmm. a multipolar model in which also the different types of power and the different modes of interconnection have different types of, 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 of uh, different logics of, uh, yeah. of association and connection. And some operate like the dollar system incredibly hierarchically. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, the only bank which can provide unlimited quantities of dollars is, is the Fed. And the others are bipolar. Um, yeah. Others others are uh, a kind of a, a relatively uh, harmonious, multi-centered sort of mm -hmm. system. A am I right? Uh, am I right in yeah. interpreting, uh, based on a, a recent essay you wrote, uh, that in which you kind of categorize the world already into kind of three main hubs with their own supply chains coming into them: China, the eurozone, and the U.S. Am I right in saying that you're maybe seeing the future as a, I guess, a tripolar world or? Something, so, something. Well, I think like it already that. is. I don't think we need to talk about the future. It clearly mm -hmm. already is. Okay. That, that's that's a you know if you look at even the trade flows between those blocks, they're actually not that huge, right? Yeah. Um, because once you get to a, an entity the size of the eurozone, you have to have macroeconomic policy as perverse as the eurozone to generate a trade surplus, which the eurozone has managed to do for many years, which is mm -hmm. historically unusual. You know, once you get to a block that big, it ought largely to be you no. Know, it, it's quite commonly self-sufficient or close to. Um, the United States is similar. I mean, you know, the, the overwhelmingly largest trade flows of the United States are with Mexico and Canada, mm -hmm. um, because the North Atlantic, uh, uh, the, North, the North American uh, block is a, is a sort of rather integrated entity. So yes, at that level, that's already a reality. Mm -hmm. And we sh shouldn't, for a second, underestimate the huge significance of the East Asian zone, essentially around China, China um, which includes Japan. Japan now. And you, you can track this. You know, there's very good studies um, by the IMF, which have looked at the correlation in the movements of exchange rates, and you quite clearly see that even though there isn't a formal peg relationship, um, exchange rates move uh, in a series of clusters. And there's one around the euro, there's one around the dollar, and there's another one around uh, the Chinese currency. <laughs> so, I think that that kind of that kind of model already exists. I think it's a kind of mental map that most of us have. If you talk to investors, this is the way they map the world as well. They think about, I mean, it's quite difficult to remind them sometimes that the eurozone exists, but it, it clearly does. So yes, I think that's the reality that we're in. So Professor Professor, I have, I have one uh, one question that is just being lingering across my head. Once you mentioned uh, the ECB as, as, as the World Bank. Um, Of course, uh, there's been a lot of speculation when it comes to to the European bond, right? A lot of, uh, as we mentioned before, it's, it's 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 it was a proposal, and there's been many amendments, many politication politicization of of the subject. But my question to you would be, if we see a a product, so let's say that even if it's a an asset which is created with the EU as a whole or just a subset of of countries within the EU. Do you think that asset would be would pose some sort of competition to the U.S. treasuries in terms of a safe haven kind of asset? Do you think that it's a serious it is a serious um, proposition to make, or do you think that the U.S. Uh, treasury is still by default and will always be that safe asset? I mean, uh, in the first instance, of course, it wouldn't be no, because you need deep markets. Uh, you need you need a track record. Uh, you would have to be clear about the actual construction of this of this euro bond. Let's put it the other way around. It's completely unimaginable to have a scenario in which uh, the euro displaces the dollar, hmm. um, and the Europeans attain this, you know, whatever it is, financial sovereignty or whatever that they sometimes invoke, without a deep market for a European safe asset. Uh, that could be the Bund. I mean, the Bund de facto could serve as that, but then you'd need a German government that was actually willing to borrow. And it's not obvious that even the German government would be large enough, because after all, it's only a quarter of the Eurozone economy. So that isn't really going to do the job for you. you. You cannot really have a fully featured reserve currency unless you have a deep asset market, uh, you know, in, in something that's generally regarded as safe. Uh, and it, you know, it would be easy to imagine how you would create such a product. You could mm -hmm. do it directly, or you could do it by various types of synthetic product. There's been lots of discussions about this, but certainly it is, um, you know, it's a, it's a characteristic weakness of the European conversation about economic sovereignty that it does not see the connection yeah. and refuses to make the connection between the availability of large sophisticated and deep markets for safe assets in the united states and 
the dollar role, which many Europeans feel so ambiguous about. Mm -hmm. There is a profound failure of political discourse and political education um, in explaining the relationship between debts and assets to large chunks of the European public. There is genuine perplexity about the fact that, you know, in the German case, you could be very proud about the Schwarzenegger and your surpluses, and also simultaneously frustrated about extremely low interest rates. Yes. I mean, no, and no one, <laughs> no one appears to be able to compute. I mean, I have facetiously asked German <laughs> finance ministry officials how large the debt issuance would need to be for German interest rates to rise to a level that would satisfy the members of the German Savers Association. And fascinating, we're actually performing that experiment right now. No. So we may find out. <laughs> um, and you know, it's a substantial amount and the interest rates don't go crazy and there's no inflation and nothing happens and you just simply adjust you know, portfolios. But, the, but that failure to connect is, is, is disastrous. Yeah. Um, because thinking of debt simply as liability, thinking of debt simply as a kind of curse rather than as an asset yes. and a safe asset and a way in which we manage complex portfolios, you know, that's disabling. And it's, it's totally ahistorical. It's as though debt only arises to satisfy, you know, welfare bills you feel vaguely <laughs> guilty about ever having run up, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking about debt as a vehicle for the productive generation of state power, which if you come from the Netherlands or the Great Britain, is evidently what debt is about, right? It is right there in the early history, the early modern history of our states, mm -hmm. that functioning capital markets that are deep and that can absorb state debt in moments of crisis and need are crucial to private financial prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and understanding that connection is just, you know, is, is a, uh, and failing to communicate the necessity of that connection is a, is a real is a real failure on the part of European politics. Mm -hmm. is, is that why you, in one of your tweets, supported this sort of idea of a subgroup of European countries to bringing up uh, something similar to a sort of like a joint asset? Is that well, the same I, I do, logic? Yeah, I mean, I do that. I mean, I, 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 that's as much polemical as anything else, I yeah. think. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and fair enough, in the current context, we're in a polemical context, right? So, I mean, I, I, I'm actually, as a historian, I wonder whether in years to come, we won't doubt the wisdom of Macron leading, and I imagine he led it, I don't know, that coalition of nine states in advancing the Corona bomb proposition when they did. It was, to say the least, a high-risk strategy. But having made that proposition, anyone, and that included me, who believes in the advancement of a federal fiscal policy needed to come out of the woodwork and say so and say so loudly. Mm -hmm. Because once somebody has jumped out of the trench and is running, you don't stay behind and go, oh, I think that was probably a bad idea. Maybe we'll wait for an offensive later and back to military stuff. The game is opened. You then go play whether or not you want to. And they opened the game. They made that move. And so, yes, it seems to me that having opened the game, the next logical thing to say is, so what's your plan B? When the Dutch and the Germans say no, what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. Are you simply going to fold and say, oh, well, you're right. Well, without you, we can't do it. No, you must have a plan B. So the plan B must be, we will do it without you. And furthermore, and this is the crucial thing, we won't do it unguarded and unprotected. The ECB said and has come out and said, that it supports corona bonds. So let's call the ECB on that and say, well, why don't you back a group of nine states? You know, and these include yeah. mm -hmm. highly reputable financial actors. Italy as well has been running primary surpluses. Italy boasts a fiscal track record in the last generation in conservative terms, and I don't approve of them, but if you are conservative, vastly superior to that of the Netherlands and Germany. Yeah. Only one year of deficit in mm -hmm. 2009, right? So anyone in their right mind would be willing to take a punt on this group, right? Because they actually do have very serious fiscal capacity. Mm -hmm. You know, how can, how could they not have a rating at least as good as that of the UK government? I mean, for crying out loud, in the middle of Brexit, we're still, whatever it is, double A rated. This, yeah. this shouldn't be a problem if you link Portugal, Italy, Spain, and France. So for me, it's also an acid test of where the, whether the French are serious. Mm. Because the question really is, are the French willing to break with Germany? Because the conventional interpretation of French policy since the 80s has been to be as close to Germany as possible, to stay out of harm's way, and not to get dumped into the bucket with the Italians. Yeah. Now, if Macron is serious about this move, it seems to me that they, their next step has got to be to threaten Germany and the Dutch, that they will do this nine group thing, which is not a bad thing to do anyway. Everyone ought to be pleased. It will be a step in the right direction, and the ECB should back them up. So that's the... It's because, as it were, 
I'm not sure whether it's my ideal, but since tactically now we're in a world in which the question has been put, we have to think tactically about what we do do next. Yeah. And that would seem to be an obvious next step. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we don't have a lot of time yet, but there is still one link that uh, I feel like we should cover to some extent, and that's, that's really China. Uh, w what's very interesting to me is that while especially also after the 2008 crisis, the ECB and the Fed have to an extent, uh, you know, become very globally active actors. We can't necessarily say the same thing about the People's Bank of China. And I'm, I'm curious, what, what is the reason for this? Well, I mean, I think it's a very, it's a very fascinating question. Mm -hmm. um, and um, for me, and this was the concluding chapter of, of Crash, um, mm -hmm. For me, the turning point comes in 2015, 2016, um, because we were in the West distracted by other things. We were distracted by the Syriza government in Greece. We were distracted by the Ukraine crisis. We were distracted by the refugee crisis in Syria and Germany and Austria. But in macroeconomic terms, what was happening globally is one of the more destabilizing moments of the last decades, which is the sudden um, collapse in confidence in China and implosion of the Shanghai Stock Exchange mm -hmm. starting in the spring of 2015. And mm -hmm. then a very large run on the Chinese currency, about a trillion dollars hemorrhaged out of China. And that doesn't have to be foreign money. That's just rich Chinese saying, I'm getting the hell out of Xi <laughs> Neo Maoist scenario, right? Because mm -hmm. we always say capital flight. We think of evil foreign speculators. No, mm -hmm. it's just local rich people saying, I need to reallocate my portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't fancy. And they do it with their children. They want to send them to Chinese universities. They send them to the sort of universities, you know, in the Netherlands or in, or in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 what happens, even a country with the reserves of China can't, handle the run right mm -hmm. um so their their exert their reserves fell from four trillion to three trillion in the space of a few months and um that was a huge shock and mm -hmm. what's really fascinating and i was totally i was really alerted to this it was a, an economist the economist magazine there's an annual roundup you know the world economy in the last year and all of a sudden you find yourself reading the flagship of international liberalism the flagship of the washington consensus mm -hmm. celebrating the fact that in 2015 the world was saved by the fact that beijing reimposed exchange controls mm -hmm. you know and at that moment you realize oh we're not we're not in kansas anymore like this is <laughs> this is really strange right yeah. because what we're basically saying as the flagship of global liberalism is phew Thank God, the Maoist regime in China decided to reimpose government controls. Mm -hmm. Because right now, the thought of having a Chinese balance of payments that was actually free, free moving, given how large it is, and given that this is still an emerging market economy with an, uns, you know, it does, it's not an unstable political system, but it's mm -hmm. just not clear what relations between the Xi regime and the elite of China actually are. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's going to be mob. I mean, I, 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 all of those fantasies seem like American wishful thinking. But clearly, <laughs> when the rich Chinese people get worried, they take lots of money out of the country quick. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so liberalism and the stability of the global economy has come to depend on the success of this authoritarian one-party state with mm -hmm. a distinct Marxist, like you know, in, intellectual DNA, um, continuing not to liberalize and therefore to move towards a situation in which the People's Bank of China was really a counterpart to the ECB and the Fed, hmm. but instead to maintain its very peculiar regime, which is peculiar only in the 21st century sense, because it's doing what every central bank in the world did in the 1950s, right? So it's got exchange controls, it has direct control of bank balance sheets, it can do macroprudential regulation all over the place, it can target lending programs. These are the sorts of instruments that central banks in the West had um, until they went for the new model independent central bank in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Even direct monetary finance, it turns out, because a lot of us have been thinking about that because of the Bank of England announcement. That turns out to have been completely normal too until the 1990s when people started saying that was the wrong way to run a central mm -hmm. bank. You shouldn't have big overdrafts. Everything should go through the capital market. So, so China is in a sense, as it were, a a, a not a fossil because that implies some sort of inevitable tendency, mm -hmm. but a few a, decades a behind into the present yeah. of modes of governance, which kind of in the West we might wish we had, mm -hmm. um, but abandoned. Mm -hmm. And and so that's why the People's Bank of China is not the same. And I, I know for a fact, speaking to people at central banks in the West, that they're they're glad it isn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, and that and the, the China is for them 
easier to work with. The downside politically, of course, is the people in the People's Bank of China who were the liberalizers mm -hmm. were liberalizers. So they were pro-Western, Anglophone, cosmopolitan, international central bankers. And for them, using the project of liberalization was a way of curbing political discretion. It was the classic 1980s, 1990s independent central bank agenda being applied to the biggest problem ever, which is opening up the Chinese economy, right? This mm -hmm. isn't Hungary or Romania uh, or Argentina. This is the Chinese economy that you're <laughs> going to apply this technique to. It was a huge risk. And it's, it's pretty clear that that strategy, that, or this, that tactic has stopped working in Beijing. And many people on the outside who used to ally themselves with that agenda, so the IMF, the World Bank, the Fed, the BIS, would get behind that liberalizing force within China have suddenly had second thoughts and don't think <laughs> it's necessarily the best thing either, mm -hmm. because we would rather that they have their hands on all of the controls. Mm -hmm. um, and to that extent, the People's Bank of China can't be a direct counterpart to the Fed or the ECB. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, just imagine if it was the ECB. I mean, <laughs> sorry, sorry to laugh, but I mean, you've now added a new nightmare to my repertoire. <laughs> I mean, imagine, imagine if the People's Bank of China had the constraints on its behavior that the ECB does. I mean, if it was the Fed, we could probably live with it. But, but you know, imagine if it was this hobbled actor with 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 an uncertain political foundation. That's mm -hmm. that's that's not that's not the the uh, the, the position of the of the PBOC. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it, I think we're kind of at the end of the interview, but uh, I guess one last thing uh, that I wanted to ask is that you've, and, and we've already kind of discussed this, but you've, you've proposed the need for a, a visionary government. And I'm just wondering what that would look like in your eyes to, to deal with this crisis right now. Uh, is, is it just essentially uh, uh, doing all it takes or does it entail something more for you? I, I had problems with the audio. The, oh, the beginning. sorry. Uh, yeah. What, what, what I was saying is that uh, you proposed a, a visionary government uh, as, as a response to dealing with the corona crisis uh, uh, in, a, in a recent uh, foreign policy article. And, uh, and I was just wondering, what would that look like for you beyond just doing what it means? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, that, that the central theme of that piece was uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? The central, piece, the central, the central reality that we have to deal with is, you know, radical uncertainty in a form. We, we used to talk about radical uncertainty last year, and we thought it was geopolitical competition between mm -hmm. China and America. We're dealing with radical uncertainty now on a far more fundamental and existential level. Um, and um, in a situation like that, that has rather specific economic implications, which mm -hmm. are that you would expect conservative behavior on the part of both consumers and businesses. And that's very bad news for growth. Um, whichever direction we want growth to go in, green or conventional, it's very bad news for any kind of investment, which is crucial for, say, the green transition, because we don't know what the horizon is going to be. Um, and under circumstances like that, the question is, where does a solid future orientation come from? Because if investment has to be orientated towards some vision of the future, mm -hmm. that could be generated from the private sector. I mean, if you live in the United States, you know, we're constantly bombarded with private sector visions of the future. California is an endless generator of visions of the future. It doesn't have to come from the government or from intellectuals. Mm -hmm. It could come out of civil society, out of business in a totally you know, uh, commercially driven direction. But the question simply is, in the most general form, how do we orientate ourselves to the future at all? Yeah. I mean, we know this personally. How do you make a plan for your travel or non-travel three months from now, right now? Now, if that's your problem, imagine that for a big business. Mm -hmm. So all I was saying in that piece is from somewhere, we need an orientation in the future. Otherwise, the economic consequences are going to be quite drastic because investment will fall or plunge and consumption mm -hmm. behavior will collapse and we will we will we will uh, see a surge in savings. So that is the role. Mm -hmm. That's it's a very general sense in which we at this moment need sources of clarity about mm -hmm. what the future might be. And that, that's yeah. the sense in which we need vision. It's not a specific demand for any particular program, though of course mm -hmm. I have ideas and I would love mm -hmm. it to be a Green New Deal. I can be ever state person in the world. Yeah. But 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 right now the problem is just how do we generate a future of any yeah. kind? Yeah. Um since most of us right now can't plan as far as the summer. Yeah. I mean we don't we don't know what whether children have I mean whether my university reopens in September. It's mm -hmm. not obvious that it does. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it, that's the sense in which we need vision. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we need we need we need sources of of authoritative, compelling, con- semi consensual visions of what the future is going to be, in the wake of this shock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Professor Adam Tus, it was a pleasure having you. Definitely, I think. Uh, we all have fun. I think that all the people on the other end of the of this of the live stream uh, did as well. We're sorry for causing you a lot of uh, future nightmares with the Fed and and the ECB, <laughs> but I hope that we minimize that. Uh, again, we cannot thank you enough. Thank you very much. Yeah, for your, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. And I think stay, we're going to cut well the and, live stream. And socially distance and put some masks on. Yeah, yeah we'll try. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll try. We'll put a mask around the the mic. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.